together, please, and let's sing out about that victory in Jesus, 341 in your hymnal. Do your very best. Do your very best. All right, we'll start right at the beginning again. 341, first verse. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory.
and thank you, and you may be seated. Stand together, please. Shake hands with those around you. Let them know you're glad to see them here in the Lord's house. Say hello to David and Amanda.
You know, I'm not opposed to some veggie tales, but that's way deeper than veggie tales, isn't it? <laughs> Train up a child in the way this should go, amen? All right, a couple of announcements for you this evening. Uh, Easter Sunday, next Sunday, so uh, let's get to work this week and let's make sure that uh, the Lord's house is full next week. Let's make some phone calls, make some in-person calls, and do whatever it takes that we can bring more people to the Lord's house next week. And then again, you will all remember the giant candy hunt after church. Uh, none of the kids forget that, amen? Uh, so let's get ready for that. And then uh, ladies' fellowship will be April the 11th at 6.30. St. John's River trip, please sign up out there for that. And then um, Brother Matt's surgery this coming Wednesday. Please be praying for him. Good to see you tonight. Take your songbooks out and turn to number 295. 295. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin. Dwelt amongst men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day. David and Amanda with us for the you're gonna be here for the Easter egg hunt, the candy hunt. Yeah. <laughs> All right, remember those that are sick and in need of prayer, um, I, I think you probably everybody probably knows now Gina her surgery was canceled for the time being. Hopefully it won't be too much further in the future before they get straightened out about it. <clears throat> and um so remember, remember this prayer request. Um, I, and I still, still see a lot of uh, empty spots that normally there's 
good, faithful, regular people that are there. So evident there's a lot of a lot of sickness still going around. So pray for those that are sick. Let us bow our heads and look to the Lord in prayer. Brother Puckett, would you lead us? gave to the church uh, two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and I believe that uh, the only authorized entity that uh, God has given that to is to the local church, and and um, so we we try to follow the scriptural order in, in these kind of things the best that we know how, and um, we, uh, some time ago, Brother Matt was added to our staff. He's an ordained preacher. He pastored for a number of years. And, um, and I, I believe that uh, the people who, who are to administer the Lord's, or the uh, baptism, rather, is an ordained, ordained preacher. I know not everybody agrees with that. That's okay. That's their business. But that's just the way we're going to do it here. And... Um, so I wanted to uh, uh, have a vote, let you have a vote tonight to give the authority to uh, Brother Matt to baptize. Um, we're, we, we are praying about this surgery that the Lord's going to restore his voice to him and all that. If he doesn't, uh, we got another job that we got to give him to fill in. So we want him to uh, be able to baptize. <laughs> Just kidding, but I, I need somebody to make a motion that, that we grant that authority. All right, you get that down. Somebody okay? All in favor, raise your hand. All right, Brother Matt.
Yeah, I'm going to need some help tonight because I'm, not only is my voice weak, my whole body is weak, so, so, so help me out tonight. Turn, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> Brother Tony this morning uh, preached from Romans chapter 8, mentioned that it was kind of the crown jewel that chapter, kind of the crown jewel of the book of Romans. Tonight we'll be looking at the crown jewel of the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, called the, uh, the resurrection chapter. I want to begin reading in uh, verse, verse 35, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beast, another fishes, another birds. That kind of do, does away with evolution right there, doesn't it? One verse. These are also, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, Another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, so are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we are born the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, uh, in uh, verse 35, Paul raises two great questions. Uh, question number one, how are the dead raised up? And then question number two, with what body do they come? Now, all of us are interested in those two questions. Uh, one of these days, if you're say, uh, saved, if you know Christ as your personal Savior and then uh, forgiveness of sins, then you're going to have a brand new body. So first of all, I want to call your attention to the, to the proof for the new body. Paul goes to the world of nature and using analogies from the world of nature, he proves that the believer will have a new body. For instance, in verse 36 and 37, you notice that he goes to the world of botany. And from the world of botany, plant life, he shows that the new body is going to have continuity. Now, what he's doing here. Paul is just raising a seed to our mind. He said, think for a moment what happens to a seed. If I'd have had the time and thought about it, I would have brought, I would have brought a seed up here so that you, could, you wouldn't have to just imagine. You could see the seed. But just imagine that I'm holding here between my fingers, I'm holding a, a seed. Now he said, this seed has got to die. It cannot bring forth life unless it dies. That's what he teaches in verse 36. 
So what happens to a seed? You have a, let's just say, for instance, a, a wheat seed. You drop that wheat seed in the ground. It goes through a process of decomposition and disintegration. And then out of that seed, there comes a plant. Out of that seed, there comes new life. Out of the death of the seed, there's, there's the life of the plant. So he's, say, he's saying here, we know from the world of nature that there's going to be a resurrection body of the believer. You see, every time we see an acorn buried in the soil, and from that soil, a mighty tree appear. It's God's message to us from the world of nature that there's going to be a resurrection of the body, life out of death. Now, Paul is saying here that there's going to be continuity. There's going to be something that is going to be recognizable. In other words, uh, one of these days, Gene Wiggins is going to die, and my body is going to be, be buried in a grave. And then in the resurrection, Jesus, uh, Gene Wiggins is going to rise again from the dead. There will be continuity. I'll be the same individual. I'll be the same person. The, same, the person that was buried is the person that's going to be resurrected, but it will be a new body, like the, the, the seed that died produces a new plant. Now you say, well, how in the world can that occur? Well, you notice in verse 38... He answers the question because he said, God, God gives it a, a body as it has pleased him and to every seed his own body. Now what Paul is pleading here is the power of God. From a human perspective, this is impossible. But from a divine perspective, all things are possible. You see, you always have, uh, you have to be aware of what you are presuppositions are. You'll, you'll always uh, determine what you believe about a matter according to your presupp presupposition. Now you see, I start with a very basic presupposition. I start from the viewpoint that there is a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, who created this universe and is in charge of this universe. Now, if this all-powerful God was able to create our body in the first place, well, then he can create our new body in the second place. It resides in the power of God. So from the world of botany, we learn from that the res resurrection body is going to have continuity. It'll be different, but yet it'll be the same. Now, in verse 39, he moves to the world of zoology. And he tells us there's, that there's a different difference in kinds of flesh. He said in verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh. But every flesh has its own identity. So he says there's one flesh of men, another beast, another fish, another birds. You see, the flesh of a beast makes it adaptable to its environment. The flesh of a fish makes it adaptable to its environment, to water. The flesh of a bird makes it adaptable to the air. And the flesh of a human being is adaptable to a civilized world. Now, his point is this. Our resurrection body is going to have adaptability. Now, one of these days, this whole world is going to be over. God has given us a body that's a doubt about this world, this physical world that we know. We, we live in this world. We, we comprehend this world. We relate to this world by means of our physical senses. We see, we hear, we touch, we taste, and we smell. We relate to this world on the basis of the kind of flesh that God has given to us. But you see, God has promised us another world. God has promised that he's prepared for us a wonderful place called heaven. See, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. The resurrection teaches our body will have adaptability. This resurrection body will be adaptable. It'll be su suited for the environment 
of heaven. This body here, this body that we wear now, would not be a doubtful to heaven. God's going to have to give us a new body. That resurrection body is going to be a doubtful to the environment of heaven. Now, I don't know all, all that entails. I don't have to know it all to enjoy it. I, all I do is just praise God that when I get to heaven, I'm going to be perfectly adapted to my heavenly environment. So from the world of body, we learned that new body is going to have continuity. From the world of zoology, we learned that new body is going to have adaptability. But then he takes us up into outer space, and he moves us into the realm of astronomy. And in the realm of astronomy, he shows us that the new body is going to have individuality. Now, what he's trying to point out here by his reference to the sun and the moon and the stars, and that each of them have their own glory, is that each of them has a different arrangement of matter. Uh, for instance, the sun's surface is covered with gases. The moon's surface is covered with titanium. You remember when our first astronauts stepped on the moon, they discovered that the dust on the surface of the moon was titanium. You know why? Well, titanium is a perfect reflector. And that's exactly what God said the moon was intended to be. God said that he created the moon in order to be a reflector of the light of the sun. So there's a different glory of the sun. There's a different glory of the moon. And then, of course, there's an altogether different continuation makeup of the stars. Each star has its own magnitude. Each one has individual identity. And you see, friends, the Bible says that our resurrection, resurrected body is going to be different from any, anybody else in the whole world. That's also true of our physical body. We, there's nobody else just like us. I know sometimes, you know, you hear about identical twins, but there's always some little difference. There's always something. There's not, it's not a perfect identity. And so, uh, so just like our physical body is, is different, we're, you know, none of, aren't, aren't you glad that you aren't like me? Well, I'm happy that I'm not like you. So, hey, isn't that, you know, uh, I'm glad that, that there are differences in all of us. You know, they're trying to, now, nowadays, they're trying to make everybody alike. You know, they don't want there to be any male and female. They want everybody to be alike. So, you know, so they've come up with this stupid idea that there's a hundred different genders. Anytime that you hear somebody saying that, you just mark it down. That is that about the dumbest individual that you have ever heard. I don't care what kind of degrees he's got after his name. I don't care what kind of a scientist he may call himself. Uh, he is about as dumb as a rock. I mean, a little second grader in our Sunday school here understands that that that's, that's, can't be. God made them male and female. That's it. Male and female. And God has also made a difference between humanity, between humanness, and animals, and fish, and birds. There's a difference. <clears throat> that's, the way, that's the way God made them. God made them with a body, with flesh, that was adaptable to whatever their environment is. You cannot live under the water very long. And you're not, you're not going to fly up there very long either. I mean, you may, you may uh, think you're going to fly, jump off the building, think you're going to fly, but you've been, you've been using too many, too many drugs because uh, you're not going to fly. You're going to hit the bottom. And there's going to be a splatter. But I'm glad that, uh, that when we get to heaven, we're all we're going to be different. We're all going to have that special something. We're all going to have that special identity. But I'll tell you, the good thing about it is it's going to be an improvement. It's going to be a real improvement when we get to heaven. 
I mean, one of these days, you and I will be walking up there in heaven. I'll be walking this way. You'll be coming this way. And you'll, and you'll look at me, and you'll stop, and you'll blink your eyes, and you'll rub them, and you'll say, Brother Wiggins, is that you? And I'll say, yes, that's me. And you're going to say, what an improvement. I hardly recognized you. <laughs> oh, yes, from the world. So from the world of nature, he proves the reality of our resurrection bodies, the proof of the new body. Now then, beginning verse 42, down through 40, uh, verse 44, he talks about the perfection of the new body. In verses 42 and 44, what you have here is a contrast. And you'll notice that he uses these words several times. It is so, it is sown, it is raised. It is sown, it is raised. He's talking about the death of the body, and he's talking about the resurrection of the body. He's talking about the natural body that will be buried, and he's talking about the spiritual body that will be raised. Same body and yet different. It is sown, it is raised. Same body, and yet it's different. A resurrection body, yet have an identity, continuity, and individuality, as I've already suggested. All right, let's look at the contrast. He said, first of all, it is sown in corruption. Now, of course, that word corruption just identifies the human experience right there. Did you know that the moment you are born, you begin to die? The moment you are born, you begin to die. And these old bodies of ours are in a process of corruption, a process of decline. Now, we try to resist it. We try to hinder that process. People are constantly looking for the fountain of youth. They're trying to find something that will keep these old bodies from disintegrating and decaying and corrupting. So we do all kinds of things to maintain personal fitness. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think that's good to try, you know, try to help yourself. I, <clears throat> I think it was Brother Carter or say that if I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. And I feel the same way. I, didn't, I had no idea that I'd be, I'd, I'd be this old and the rapture had not taken place yet. All of my, all of my life since I've been saved, I've thought, well, it's going to be, it's going to be shortly. It's going to be shortly. You say, well, uh, does it discourage you that it hasn't? No, it doesn't. It just means I'm just one day closer. Every day I'm just one day closer. Uh, but I know it's going to happen. I'm not discouraged about it at all. I know that it's going to take place. But we do all kinds of things to maintain personal fitness and where we should. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, physical fitness will uh, uh, increase the length of your life, but it will certainly increase the quality of your life. In other words, it's, it's not how long you make it, it's how you make it long, right? So we have fitness training and proper diet and all those things to maintain strength as long as we possibly, possibly can. <clears throat> I was walking out of Publix the other day, and, and there was an old guy in front of me uh, pushing a cart. And, and he was, it looked like he'd just barely make it, you know. He, and, and I zipped by him, you know, with my cart. And, and he said, hey, hey, he said, uh, you, younger, you younger guys, you whippersnappers, young whippersnappers, said, uh, you, you know, you're just kind of showing off here. And... Uh, I said, I said, no, I'm not, not trying to show off it. I said, how old are you? He said, I'm 71. I said, I'm 87. <laughs> he said, you're lying. <laughs> he said, what, what kind of a diet? I said, I, I eat fried chicken, fried bacon, greasy, and double eggs in the morning, and, and, um, and I had a drink... Um, I drink. I used to drink Coke, but not since they said that that uh, only uh, you know that, that drinking Coke should make you lighter, or shouldn't make you lighter. How is it? Uh, darker or something? So I just drink Pepsi now. But um, 
I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, the diet doesn't have, you know, it's not something good about it. But, uh, but I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, but I haven't lived on any diet. I just eat whatever I like. I was raised on fried food. And that's the only kind I like. I don't like any kind of meat that's not fried. And, uh, well, I'll take that back. I do like roast beef, you know, when it's uh, cooked, whatever you do to it, bake it or whatever, and uh, things like that. But, but uh, my mama even fried steak. She had a griddle on top of the stove, and, and she'd slap that steak up there, you know, and, and cook it on one side, turn it over, cook it on the other side, and, uh, and she did it well done. My mama tried to be scriptural. The Bible says that you're not eat any flesh with blood in it. And so I want my meat, I want it well done. I don't want any blood, any blood running out of it. And uh, I know, you know, some of you look at me like, and some of you, you know, you even made fun when you've gone with me and you call my steak a hockey puck. <laughs> well, I call yours a piece of raw meat. And you're not supposed to be eating raw meat. I'm just kidding. I I I think you know. I think you ought to you ought to eat healthy food. I think you ought to. Um, I. But I don't know. You know. I don't know. I uh, I know a lot of people that that uh, just like just like me. They've not really been on any diet all their life. Yeah, they've done okay, but but um, but we do try. We do try. You know, our our skin begins to wrinkle and it, and it gets age spots on it, and our bones get brittle. And you have to be very careful that you not break a bone because the older these old bodies get, the more brittle our bones become. Our muscles begin to reduce in their strength, and and so there comes a point. These old bodies of ours have more and more corruption upon them. It's a losing battle, isn't it? We're all going to die. We're all going to die. And ladies and gentlemen, when it's all over, your body and mind is going to be a mass of corruption. That's all it's going to be. It's going to have its disease. It's going to have its infirmity. It is sown in corruption. But all this, and Paul says it's raised in incorruption. That simply means that you're going to have a brand new body. There'll be no disease in that body. There'll be no corruption in that body. I like to speculate on what that new body is going to be like, raised in, cor in corruption. Every fiber of that body, every cell of that body is going to declare incorruption, incorruption, incorruption. And I'll tell you what, friends, you'll never grow old when you get to heaven. I used to hear the old timers sing that old song, in a land where we'll never grow old. And I'll tell you, it'd be a wonderful thing to know that when we get our new body, it'll be raised in incorruption. And then look at the second contrast. It's sown in dishonor. And the word dishonor here refers to one who's lost his civil rights. That's the way the word was used in those particular days, one who has lost his civil rights. When a person dies, they lose all their rights. That makes sense, doesn't it? Sometimes a, a prosperous man dies and you hear people discussing his death and someone says, I wonder how much he left. Somebody says, oh, maybe a million dollars, maybe two million. I've got news for you, friend. He left it all. He left it all. Five seconds after you've died, you're penniless. You've lost your right to money. You you. You've got houses and lands. You've got stocks and bonds. The moment you die, it's all gone. It's lost. You're sown in dishonor. I mean, there you are. You don't have a thing. There are no pockets in shrouds. It is sown in dishonor. But I'll look at the other side. It's raised in glory. Now, what that means is you're going to have a glorified body. You see, this is what changes death altogether for the believer. You see, when a believer understands this truth that we're, that we're studying here tonight, it changes the whole perspective of death because, you see, death for the believer is just a shuttle bus 
that carries us to heaven. Death for the believer is just a powder room where we get ready for glory. We're going to have a glorified body. Now, the Bible says we're going to have a body like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, talking about that glorified body, said in Philippians, the third chapter, for our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that is our body of, of humiliation and weakness, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Now you think about the body of the Lord Jesus. In his virgin-born body, when he took upon himself flesh, the Lord Jesus was subject to hunger. He was subject to weariness. He got tired. He required sleep. And yet when the Lord Jesus Christ was raised again from the dead in a glorified body, in that glorified body, Jesus Christ was able to go through closed doors, just go right, right through closed doors. I'll tell you, it's going to be something when we get our glorified body. You may just be able to travel with the speed of thought. I don't know. I've often, I've often said, I think that with our glorified body, all we have to do is just think about, I'd like to spend a couple of days on Pluto, and we'll be there. I don't, you know, I like to think, think that. I, I, I can't prove that, but, but I like to think that. It's going to be something, that, that glorified body. You know, God, God may give you assignments in that glorified body. He may send you all over his universe. God may send you to a different galaxy to work for him. It won't matter where you go. You're going to have a glorified body. You're going to have a body like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't, don't you imagine that uh, the new heaven, new earth, when God uh, creates everything new, uh, don't you imagine that there's, there's going to be angels living on some of those planets that have been made new? And maybe we can too. You know, you may have a summer home on Pluto. You may have uh, uh, a winter home on Mars. Or they're, they're all, they're all, all of those, when, when God remakes this universe, recreates it, you're going to be live, able to live anywhere out there with your glorified body. And so will, so will those angels. People ask me sometimes, do you think that these UFOs, you think that's angels? I don't know. I, you know, I, I kind of doubt it, but it could be. I mean, angels can do a lot of things. But I, but I don't know why they would, uh, you know, be going around in UFOs. They don't need to. <laughs> uh, they're the, the angelic body. They can go anywhere they want. They don't need a, a UFO. They don't need a jet plane. Then notice here the third contrast is sown in weakness. You know, there's nothing any more weak than a dead body. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious, but, but a dead body can't, couldn't lift a feather. Nothing any more weak than a dead body. Did you know that a dead body can't fight back? If, if you go into a funeral home somewhere and you slap the face of a dead body, it won't hit you back. It won't hit you back. I mean, it's just totally weak, totally helpless. That's as weak as you can get. I mean, when you're dead, friend, you're dead. You're dead. You're weak. It is sown in weakness. But I'll look at the contrast. It's raised in power. Think about that. You see, our bodies today are dominated. Our natural bodies are dominated by the soul. The spiritual body is going to be dominated by the spirit. We learned that in verse 4. There is a natural body dominated. You see, a soul body dominated by the soul. There's a spiritual body dominated by the spirit. Now, when we're saved, the Lord Jesus comes to dwell in our hearts and the Bible says that we're to be filled with the Spirit and to the capacity that these old natural bodies of ours are capable, every day we ought to pray, 
for the filling of the Holy Spirit, to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. But there, there are always human natural limitations. You know yourself, there are times whenever you may be filled with the Spirit, but there are times when you're not. But I want to tell you what, friends, when we get our glorified body, we get that spiritual body made like the body of Jesus Christ, the power of God can flow without measure through our hearts. I tell you, it would be, be glorious to serve God in a glorified, powerful body like that. So there's the perfection of our new body. body. But then he talks about, number three, the purpose of the new body. Now, I want you to follow the logic here very carefully. Follow the line of thinking very carefully. Here's the purpose. Here's why God is going to give us a resurrection body. He said, verse 45, the first man, that was Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, that was Jesus, was made a life-giving spirit. You see, Jesus Christ, the last Adam, undid what the first Adam brought about. And you see, Jesus Christ is able to give life. Now, through Adam, through our physical birth, we get our physical life. But through the Lord Jesus Christ, we get our second birth. We get our spiritual life. Now, these old bodies of ours are stamped with the image of the earthy. That's what he said. All the way down, right on down through verse 46, 47, 48. That which is of the earth is earthy. We're marked with the, with the old dust of Adam. How did God make Adam? He scooped down into the dirt, into the earth. And he formed, fashioned Adam out of, out of the dust of the earth. And we, we inherit the nature, the Adamic nature, his nature of body. We inherit death from old Adam. We inherit sin from old Adam. These are earthy bodies. We bear the image of the earthy. But you see, God has declared in this resurrection body we're going to bear the image of the heavenly. Now what that means is God is going to give you a new body and that when you have in, and, and, uh, when you're in heaven with the Lord Jesus, you're going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in the message last Sunday, I preached that we're, we're being conformed to the image of his son, but that the finality, the perfection will not play, take place until we see him. Uh, John says we'll, we'll see him, we'll be like him, but we, uh, we shall see him as he is. Now, to me, that's an astounding concept. In fact, did you know that's exactly what God saved you to be? Remember last Sunday morning, Romans chapter 8, verse 29? It says, for whom he did foreknow. Now, see, for the, the foreknowledge of God, God knew that you were going to be saved. He didn't make you be saved. He knew that you would be saved. The foreknowledge of God for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, friend, what that simply means, it means that God has predetermined that every soul that is saved, every person who's born again, is one day going to bear the image of the heavenly. He's going to be conformed to the image of God, dear son. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 again. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's going to be a wonderful thing, isn't it? To have a resurrection body. These old bodies get tired and worn out, and disease gets a hold of them, and they start falling apart and decaying and corrupting. And, and we know death is on our trail, just like a runner. He starts off the race, he's way ahead, but he notices there's another runner that's gaining on him. You see, that's exactly the way life is. 
death is gaining on us all the time. And if Jesus doesn't come, it'll overtake us one of these days. But let me tell you what, my friend, when they, t when they take you and me out there to that graveyard, take these old bodies of ours, these old bodies that are filled with corruption, sown in corruption, sown in dishonor, sown in weakness, and they put it in that grave, that's not the final chapter. Because the omnipotent, omniscient God one of these days is going to come. And when he comes, the Bible says, the dead in Christ shall be raised first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be, shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And we'll go up to the Lord in our brand new resurrection body. But now wait a minute, it's not over. The Lord Jesus in John chapter 5 verse 29 says there's a resurrection of life. That's what we've been talking about here. There's a resurrection of life. But Jesus said there's also a resurrection of damnation. There's going to be a resurrection of the damned. And if you do not know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, if you die in your sins, you're going to have a resurrection too. But it'll be a resurrection unto damnation. You see, that night that you've been out drinking all night, and the next morning you get up and you look at your bloated, reddened face in the mirror, or that night you've been out in impurity and debauchery and sin, the next morning you look in the mirror and you see that dissipated, corrupted countenance, take a good look because that's a little foretaste of the resurrection of damnation that you're going to experience if you die without the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There's going to be a resurrection of the lost. There's going to be a resurrection of the saved. And what makes a difference between where you, you have a resurrection of the lost or a resurrection of the saved is what you do with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Heavenly Father, I pray now that you bless the invitation time. I ask you to speak to every heart. If there's someone here tonight without Christ, I pray that you'll help them to come. May they realize that if they die tonight without Christ, that there'll be no second chance. That once that body's in the grave, the soul, will, the soul goes to hell. So I pray that you'll, you'll help them to come tonight before it's too late and accept the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior so that they too can have part in the resurrection unto life and not the resurrection unto damnation. If there are Christians tonight that need to re rededicate their life, I pray that you'll help them to come. Whatever the need may be, help each of us do what you have us to do. For I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. As we sing a verse of invitation song, we invite you to come tonight. If God spoke to your heart, would you come?